Welcome to this podcast on abnormal intrathoracic air collections. We're going to talk about three different types of intrathoracic air. We're going to talk about pneumothorax, which of course is air in the pleural space. We'll talk about pneumomediastinum, which is air outside the normal uh, uh, air-containing structures of the mediastinum, like the uh, trachea and the esophagus. So if you have air outside of these normal uh, structures, normally air-containing structures, that is a pneumomediastinum. Now those are two of the 22 don't miss lesions, and we're going to com uh, we're going to combine our presentations because I think it's a little bit easier. We're also going to include pericardial air, in other words, pneumopericardium, because I think that uh, you need to know about all three of these types of abnormal intrathoracic air to get a better appreciation of them. So I want you to recognize uh, when you have these uh, abnormalities uh, present. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about pitfalls, um, but you guys are going to probably have to supplement. Your, uh, this presentation with readings to uh, better figure out or better to know to better know about etiology, treatment, and prognosis. So this is supposed to illustrate a pneumothorax. So the, over there on the left, you can see that the lung. Hopefully, you can recognize that as a lung, is outlined by a black band of what should be uh, air in the pleural space. So we'll start off talking about pneumothorax because obviously that's air in the pleural space. This is an example of one on a chest x-ray. Now I've labeled the pleural line there for you. That's the visceral pleura. And the black stuff beyond the pleural line there is air in the pleural space. So it's air between the uh, visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. And that's what it looks like with the arrow removed. So that's a small to moderate pneumothorax. This is a large pneumothorax. This is a tension pneumothorax. So the right pleural space there has tons and tons and tons of air in it and the heart is being pushed over to the left and if it's pushed over a little bit too much you can kink the uh, uh, the uh, blood flow or the vessels that uh, supply uh, blood back to the heart and you can end up getting into uh, severe uh, trouble and you need to treat this uh, expeditiously with a uh, chest tube to, rev to uh, relieve some of this uh, abnormal uh, pressure. Note there that the right lung, and I've labeled the right upper lobe there for you, has taken on soft tissue density. And that can uh, happen when the uh, lungs collapse. In fact, when the lungs collapse, when you remove the air, basically you're left with a small ball of soft tissue. And that's why it takes on that increased density. So again, those that knowledge of those four basic radiographic uh, densities can be very handy, sort of explaining and understanding the uh, findings that you see radiograph. Here's another example of a bad pneumothorax. This person has a severe pneumothorax involving the left lung. And the uh, material there that you see along the, uh, um, along the spine, that very dense material, that turns out to be the left lung. The left lung is compressed. The left lung has had basically all the air pushed out of it by that uh, pneumo. I'm sorry, by that pneumothorax. And you can see that there's a tension component there also. And it may be that this uh, pneumothorax was caused by placement of that left sided central line. That's a known complication of a central line placement. Now, why does the lung take on soft tissue density when it becomes collapsed like that? So basically, what's happened there is you've got this huge air collection in the pleural space, and you can think of that sort of crudely, maybe not quite accurately, but you can think of that as sort of squashing the lung. So basically all the air within the lung has been pushed out. So the lung is now, instead of being predominantly of air density, because all the air has been pushed out, it's taken on soft tissue density. So you can think of a deflated lung as being of soft tissue density, and that's why the lung takes on that increased density, takes on that soft tissue density. All right, let's talk about some pitfalls. Let's talk about some things that you can uh, that you can make mistakes uh, when you're looking for a pneumothorax. And I've made all of these mistakes. Um, I present this uh, for um, you know for your edification, but I will certainly not uh, uh, claim that you won't uh, make uh, some of these uh, pitfalls. Um, they um, are something that affects even people who've been doing this for a long, long time. Okay. 
when you're upright, what happens to air in the chest? Well, it's going to go to the least dependent portion of the chest. So on an upright chest x-ray, it's pretty easy to diagnose a pneumothorax. But when you're lying down, what happens to the air? Of course, it's also going to rise. But instead of going to the apex of the lung, it's going to go to the anterior aspect of the, uh, of, of, of the chest wall as illustrated here. So the findings of a pneumothorax may be very difficult on a supine chest x-ray as opposed to an upright chest x-ray. It can be very difficult to make a diagnosis of a pneumothorax on a supine radiograph. Here's an example. This person has well-positioned support apparatus and a tracheal tube, feeding tube, and left-sided central line. It's very hard to see a pneumothorax, or we don't see a pneumothorax here in the, in the uh, place where we uh, expect to see one. This person is lying down. They're in the intensive care unit. What they have instead is something called a steep sulcus or a deep sulcus sign, which is illustrated there on the uh, patient's left. All the air, instead of going up like it would on an upright chest x-ray, is uh, going toward the, uh, toward the lung base. And that makes sense because that's going to be the least dependent portion of the chest. So that's one of the potential findings of a of a of a uh, pneumothorax on a supine chest X-ray. The steep sulcus sign. And this CT scan shows you why. Look how much air you see at the lung bases as opposed to along the uh, lung apex. We might be able to see this uh, chest X-ray, or we might be able to see the uh, pneumothorax on a supine chest X-ray on this uh, individual going over the lung apex, but most of the air really is at the, is at the lung base, which is why you get that steep sulcus sign. That's a good illustration of, uh, um, of the reason why you get a, a steep sulcus sign on a, a supine radiograph. Another potential pitfall is a loculated pneumothorax, and here we have an example that I've labeled there in the patient's uh, right chest. This is a, a pneumothorax that because the patient has some adhesions within the pleural space isn't free-flowing, so it's sort of pinned down there at the right lung base. So that's another potential pitfall in looking for a pneumothorax. Skin folds can be a real problem uh, looking for a pneumothorax. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about skin folds, but this person has a right-sided skin fold here that simulates a pneumothorax. Now why is that not a pneumothorax? A couple of different uh, uh, findings there. Uh, might help you. And we'll go over the, some of the details about this on some of the slides to come. But one thing you can notice is that there are still some lung markings beyond what that uh, beyond where that line uh, projects. And that's a uh, helpful but not foolproof finding that you have a skin fold instead of a pneumothorax. So how does a skin fold happen? Let's say that you were trying to get an image of a patient who was in the ICU, who was bed bound, who was supine. And what you're trying to do is you're going you're to slide a film cassette behind their back. And when you do that, perhaps you heap up a bunch of, of skin. So now a portion of the chest is much thicker than it used to, so used to be. So you've got this skin fold and maybe a little bit of air trapped along, that, uh, along the lateral aspect of the, of, of the uh, skin fold. So you go ahead and you take your radiograph and you're going to end up with an image that looks like this. Now that looks different than a pneumothorax. Basically what's happening here is you've got a thick white line instead of a thin white line. That plural line is very thin. You've got a thick white line with a black band next to it, which may represent some trapped air or may represent something called a mock band or a mock effect, which we're not going to get into because it's a little bit too, too complicated. But let's keep discussing uh, the uh, etiology and how to tell the difference between a skin fold and a pneumothorax. So on the left is a schematic of what a pneumothorax would look like and on the right is what a skin fold would look like. So the pleural line, that white line, that visceral pleural line in a pneumothorax is very, very thin. With a skin fold, remember skin folds are going to be kind of thick. So the white line with a skin fold is going to be a little bit thick. And adjacent to it, you frequently have this sort of uh, uh, black um, uh, appearing density, which could be uh, due to a mock effect or it might be due to uh, some, some trapped air. Don't worry about that uh, so much. Uh, concentrate on the fact that you've got a thin white line with the pneumothorax and a thick white line 
with a skin fold. And there's the, uh, the uh, difference between the two. On the left is a pneumothorax and on the right is a skin fold. And you can see that the white line with the skin fold is considerably thicker than the white line with a uh, with the pneumothorax. And you can also see that there are no lung markings extending beyond the uh, white line of the pneumothorax, but there are some lung markings extending beyond that um, beyond that skin fold. Another thing that skin folds do is that they don't act like pneumothorax. So a pneumothorax should be confined to one hemithorax, right? The skin fold there in this particular individual, you can see it projecting from one half of the uh, thorax over into the other half of the thorax. So that's another sign here that you're dealing with a skin fold and not with a pneumothorax. Another potential pitfall is that you can have a bulla. So you can have some areas within the uh, within the uh, lung that don't represent abnormal pneumo I'm sorry abnormal air collections within the uh, pleural space, but just represent areas where the lung has been uh, say partially uh, destroyed. So the pneumothorax is supposed to uh, be shown there on the left, sort of uh, uh, encompassing the entire lung, whereas the bulla is that focal area of uh, low uh, density or that black area at the uh, at the apex of the right lung, or I'm sorry, on your right and at the left lung apex. So here we have some example, uh, have an example here. You can see that there's low density at both lung apices. And you know you might be thinking that this person has a pneumothorax. Now there's a couple of clues there that you're not dealing with the new with the pneumothorax. One, there's a little septation right there. Uh, you shouldn't have uh, septations, or it's very uncommon to have septations within uh, patients who have pneumothoraces. We did talk earlier about inoculated pneumothorax, but those aren't particularly common. So a septation is a pretty good sign that you're dealing with Ebola. Another potential sign that you're dealing with Ebola is that bullous disease is often bilaterally. It may it occurs bilaterally. It may be asymmetric, but in this case you can see you've got this loosened stuff, the septated stuff at both lung apices. So those are some clues to help you tell the differences between bully and pneumothoraces. Very important not to put a chest tube within a, a bulla because you can end up with a chronic air leak that may, uh, that may never heal. Now, having said that, I've made the mistake and called uh, bully uh, pneumothoraces in, in the past. One of the things that can really, really help you is to get old films. If you have an old film in whatever it is that you're uh, dealing with or that you see that's abnormal, has been around for a long time, you can rest assured that that is a bulla and not a, uh, not a pneumothorax. But those are some of the things that you can use to tell the difference between a pneumothorax and a bulla. Okay, let's move on to pneumomediastinum, and obviously what that represents is air outside of the normal air-containing structures within the mediastinum. So if you have air outside the esophagus and outside the trachea, that is a pneumomediastinum. And this drawing there is supposed to illustrate pneumomediastinum with some uh, black uh, along what, it, what I hope looks like the esophagus and some uh, black along the... Uh, along the diaphragm. That's supposed to illustrate something called a continuous diaphragm sign, which we'll see in just a minute. So here we have an example of an individual with a pneumomediastinum. And they can be kind of difficult to see, but you can see some streaky opacities there, streaky opacities and lucencies within the uh, central aspect of the uh, chest. You can also see something called a continuous diaphragm sign here. Let's go ahead and just illustrate those. Those arrows there are pointing to what is uh, known as a continuous diaphragm sign. Normally, when the heart sits on top of the mediastinum, you can't draw, say, a, a, a line or an arc with a pencil from the right pneumomediastinum, I'm sorry, from the right hemidiaphragm to the left hemidiaphragm. The heart gets in the way. Here you can see that you've got this continuous diaphragm going from right to left. The other thing that you can see is this streaky lucency and opacity in the um, in the uh, mediastinum. Let's go ahead and illustrate that. You can see a little uh, line there that's, uh, uh, that um, represents a plural line that's sort of pushed uh, laterally. So this person has a pneumomediastinum. Now you can uh, crudely divide causes of pneumomediastinum 
into two uh, categories. One, things you don't really have to worry about, and two, things that you really have to worry about in a big way. Let's talk about the serious causes of the pneumomediastinum first. Remember we talked about two structures that normally contain air within the mediastinum. Those are the trachea and the esophagus. So obviously if you had a rupture of the trachea or a rupture of the esophagus due to trauma or excessive vomiting or something along those lines, you could end up with a pneumomediastinum. So that's the first thing you need to think about when you see a pneumomediastinum, although in my experience those are relatively uncommon causes of a pneumomediastinum. Much more common causes of pneumomediastinum are similar to the causes of a pneumothorax. Now let's go over some uh, ways that you, uh, that you should think about that uh, distinguish between the etiologies of a, uh, or, the, or the findings of a pneumomediastinum versus a pneumothorax. Let's talk very briefly about how a pneumothorax might occur. One way that it might occur is that if you had an alveolus that got, or a group of alveoli that became very uh, distended and eventually popped. Let's go ahead and illustrate there. So those uh, alveoli have popped, and what will happen is that if, it, that if those uh, alveoli pop into the pleural space, you'll end up with air in the pleural space, and you'll end up with a pneumomedia, I'm sorry, a pneumothorax. You could also have a group of alveoli pop and not be located in a, in a place where they could dump that abnormal air into the, into the pleural space. What will happen then is that you will dissect that air back along the bronchovascular bundles to the, uh, to the mediastinum. A pneumothorax will not cause a pneumomediastinum. That's one thing that you need to, need to appreciate. So while the etiologies may be uh, similar, you may have overdistension of alveoli that leads them to, uh, to, to, to burst, uh, what happens is that the air dumps into diff different spaces. In the case of a pneumothorax, what will happen is that the air will dump into the pleural space, and with pneumomediastinum, it will dissect back along bronchovascular bundles to the mediastinum. And that's something that actually occurs quite commonly. So people who uh, tra have transient increases in intrathoracic uh, pressures because they're straining, because they've got Valsalva maneuver going on, because they're, uh, uh, because they're giving birth, because they're lifting weights, because they've got asthma, all of these things can result in increased pressure within alveoli. Those alveoli may rupture, and if they do not rupture into the pleural space, they may rupture in a location to where the air dissects back along bronchovascular bundles and into the mediastinum, causing a pneumomediastinum. And that's a benign cause of a pneumomediastinum. Nobody's going to do anything about that. Of course, if the etiology turns out to be uh, rupture of, a, uh, of the uh, trachea or the uh, esophagus, of course, some, that's something that would have to be uh, addressed surgically. Okay, the last thing we want to talk about is the pneumopericardium. So here I've drawn some air around the heart to, to distinguish the pneumopericardium from some of those other causes of abnormal intrathoracic air. So here are, or here is an example of a pneumopericardium. So obviously, the way that you tell a pneumopericardium from a pneumothorax and a pneumomediastinum is by location. So with a pneumopericardium, what you're going to what you're going to find is an abnormal air collection that envelops the heart, just like the pericardium does. So that should be a relatively easy way to distinguish between those uh, different causes of abnormal intrathoracic air collections. Here's another example here, lots and lots of chest tubes. You can see that there's lucency completely surrounding the heart. So this person has a pneumopericardium. Okay? If you have a pneumothorax, uh, obviously that air is going to be in the pleural space. If you have a pneumomediastinum, it, uh, it would be very unusual for it to surround, surround the heart this uh, completely. So this is another example of a pneumopericardium. One last thing I want to talk about an abnormal air collection that we're going to uh, address more completely in one of the other podcasts is pneumoperitoneum. So that's another uh, abnormal air collection that you guys need to be, uh, are going to be responsible for, but obviously that's an air collection that does not occur in the chest. But sometimes it can be difficult to determine whether you've got a, um, a loculated, inferiorly located pneumothorax or a pneumoperitoneum. So in this particular example, you've got uh, air, you've got this lucency between the right hemidiaphragm and the liver indicating that you have a uh, pneumoperitoneum. 
and you know you can always uh, go back and get some history type data. Do they have chest pain? Do they have abdominal uh, pain? Things of that nature to help you uh, distinguish these uh, things in uh, difficult cases. That ends our discussion of abnormal intrathoracic air collections. Thank you.